The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. So I'm going to share with you our experience with the development of ternary blend containing flyers and silica fume for application in the bridge deck. It was actually a pilot project that served as a testing bed, if you will, for replacement of several bridges on uh, 465, which is a ring road going to Indianapolis. The reason that Indiana Department of Transportation was interested in pursuing something more durable than the regular concrete is shown here. It's one of the Indiana bridges that was constructed a few years before this project was initiated, and after three years, it looked like this. Obviously, the owner wasn't happy and said, you know, we need to do something better than that. They weren't ready to go with this experimental mix on the important artery in the city, so they relegated us to a smaller road near Fort Wayne, and this is a shot of preparation of the uh, reinforcement for the deck. You can see that Indiana is using the epoxy coated reinforcement, so it's all green and it was rather uh, densely reinforced, uh, which required that the mix would be non segregating and a relatively uh, high slump, uh, good, good uh, flow properties. When we floated the idea of using a ternary mix to the DOT, well, they ask us a very probing questions. You know, first of all, they wanted us to explain how use of those materials will actually help them to accomplish what they're after, which is higher durability and good finishability of the concrete, as well as uh, you know, explaining what it is that we, you know they've read, they heard that if you use alternative blends, very often you can take advantage of the synergistic effect of various components of the binder, and uh, they wanted to know also uh, what is the experience of using ternary blends. There were some cases of failure of uh, bridge decks with silica fume in the state of New York, so every DOT was very cautious about what's going to happen if we allow this strange material to actually go into the, into the bridge deck. So we look whatever we could for information regarding uh, how many agencies were using uh, ternary blends. This is about 2008, okay, so it's almost you know, eight years ago. And we also identified the increase in the usage of this kind of materials in the bridge deck. So that at least set up the stage for considering this material. And we propose a very extensive scope where we will evaluate various aspects of this particular uh, ternary mix and assess the suitability of this mix for the application in the bridge deck. So you can see what we were proposing, including the evaluation of the uh, field performance of the bridge itself. I wanted to start by explaining how we went about determining the synergistic effect. So that was one of the selling points, frankly, for us to convince the DOT to prepare what they call a special provision type of spec that would be used at this particular bridge. So we started, obviously, with the idea that interaction of two or more agents or forces will provide combined effect that cannot be achieved individually by using just one of the components. And we also propose a method of of verification that that synergy actually happens, and we went about it by demonstrating whether there is any physical effect as well as there is any chemical effect. So that's what I wanted to share with you first. For that, we selected four different types of mixes. Ordinary portent cement, cement with 20% of class C flyage, another mix with 5% uh, of silica fume, and finally a ternary mix that had 20% of flyage and 5% of silica fume. In an attempt to quantify the synergistic effects, we use this sim simple equation where essentially 
you account for the difference between the performance of the ordinary Fortin cement and that of mixes that were modified by adding any of those components. So let me show you what the results were. This curve over here that, that kind of goes like this, that's a theoretical property. In this case, it would be a compressive strength that we would expect based on this equation. And of course, in determining these theoretical values, we use the measured values of performance. In this case, it would be strength at 20% fly ash for, for mix with 20% fly ash for mix with 5% of silica human for tenant mix. And you can see that tenant mix showing yellow, orange here. The initial, the early age, didn't really have a performance that was much more different than the theoretical. But if you look here, starting at about, well, definitely 28 days, we see, or even earlier than that, seven days, you can see that the performance of this tenant mix over it is higher than the theoretical predicted performance, which we attributed to the synergistic effects, which we also try to quantify as I show you later. We look at other properties in addition to strength, so you, have, you can see there's rapid prior permeability. And in this case, 180 days, this is a theoretical value that would be expected for this ternary mix and you can see that we got much better performance than predicted. At 28 days, we also got a better performance. So there was a synergistic effect in our mind that was actually happening in this particular mix. This is an example of initial absorptivity, and, you see, and this is an example of secondary absorption. And in each case, you can see that ternary mixes, especially at later ages, show the better performance than that predicted theoretically. So we are trying to explain what is the source of this observed synergistic effect. And we started with the physical effects. The physical effects, in this case, could be related to higher packing density. So we assume that the silica film works with the cement particles and flash particles to, to create a more densely packed cementic system. That would be one potential idea. The other with the other very often used explanation for improvement of properties, especially in the case of using of silica film, would be increased density of the interfacial transition zone, which we didn't focus on here. What we were looking at is at the solid concentration. We design our mixes at the same water cement ratio of 0.41. And if you look at the numbers here, the solid concentration for OPC was about 0.47. It was about 0.49 for tenery mix, simply because the specific gravities of flyage and silica film are lower than those of cement. So what, what happened is that we had higher concentration of solid per unit volume of paste, if you will, and the higher concentration of solid was simply related to the fact that we had a lower specific gravity. We redesigned the mixes uh, based on the constant water cement ratio by volume. And we, when we did that and checked if there are any signs of synergistic effect, we didn't actually see it because you can see that those numbers are pretty much the same. We then did some literature research and it turns out that in order to, to get some synergistic effects related to optimization of the packing, your water cement ratio shouldn't be higher than about 0.23 by mass. Our water cement ratio is 0.41 by mass, so we couldn't claim that we have synergistic effect due to the improved overall packing. We, all, we simply had synergistic effect as a result of having more solids per unit of volume of paste. We also look at the synergy in the realm of chemical interactions. If you look at the rate of heat evolution here, you can see that this is ordinary portland cement. You can see a dominating peak due to the uh, hydration very early on of C3A and probably C3S. 
you can see a little shoulder due to the delayed hydration of C3A. But if you look at the 5% silica fume, or specifically at our tannery mix, which is shown here, 20% flyers and 5% of silica fume, you can see the second peak is actually higher than the first one because we added some alumina with fly ash and we didn't have enough sulfate, so this second peak started dominating. If you look at the cumulative heat, 5% silica fume was like concrete or mixture was reacting very fast, so it had higher output of heat than our tannery mixes had here. So we didn't get a very good evidence for the synergistic effect just looking at the heat of hydration. So what we tried to do is to calculate the water that was actually hydraulically bound in the hydration product. So we use this parameter WH, which is the difference between the non-evaporable water and the water tied up with calcium hydroxide. And if we look at it this way, you can see that our tannery blend, especially at later ages, shows up here at the top, indicating that we do have additional production of calcium silica hydrate. In fact, we done some calibration and we figured out that for each of the 1% change in this parameter WH, we are having about 6.06 cubic centimeters per gram of cement of additional CSH that is forming, if we assume that this is a formula of the CSH. So based on the information I just told you, we have some evidence of synergistic effect based on the physical evidence. We have some evidence of synergistic effect based on the chemistry of the system. So we are ready to actually work with the mix designs that will be uh, used for trial batches in preparation for the construction of the bridge. So what we've done, we selected four different mixes and based on our previous results, INDOP actually wrote a provisional standard that had these requirements. Okay, so if we look at the water cement ratio, they said, okay, it should be somewhere between 0.38 and 0.42 we selected 0.41. They didn't want to have more than 30% fly ash, so we used 20 to 30% depending on the mix. They wanted a silica fume to stay in the range from 5 to 7%, so we also accommodated that. And with respect to the paste content, they were worrying about the shrinkage, so they said, okay, it shouldn't be more than 28%, and they also wanted to have a minimum cement content of 231, because uh, they weren't quite ready to go with performance specifications. So, yeah, we need to have some, something that at least guarantees a minimum degree of performance. So you can see how our mix design map uh, with respect to their specifications. And one of the things that we've done is we use evaluation of various transport properties to determine the suitability of this mix for bridge leg application. So we, we ran our well, standard rapid dry permeability. We also ran migration test. At the time we began it, it was ash to provisional standard TP64. Right now it's already a full-fledged standard. And we also have done sortivity test, ACMC 1585, and we also did absorptivity test, the difference being that we're pounding water on the top as opposed to having it solely from the bottom. Here are some of the results. You can see the RCP values, pretty tightly uh, spaced curves, not really too much difference with respect to the mixed composition. This is a migration test results, a bit bigger spread, but also pretty tight. Those are uh, values of diffusion curve, required diffusion coefficient, and you know, for two of those mixes we got values that are unexpectedly higher. One has to remember, however, that ASCMC 1556 allows you about 40% of the difference. There's a two standard deviation allowable difference and ours was 30%. So according to that standard, uh, which realizes that there's a variability that test, we were still okay. And we also look at the 
initial absorptivity on this axis, initial sorptivity on this axis. Uh, and you can see that with respect to the absorptivity, with the exception of those two, what I consider to be outliers, we had a pretty steady decline with age. However, for two of those mixes, particularly 30% fly ash and 5% uh, silica fume, and 30% 7% silica fume, it looks like those values uh, are trending upwards. We also look at the effect of curing. How are those mixes, how the performance of those mixes will change if we change the curing conditions. So we had four different curing regimes. We had air drying, we had seven day curing by compound. We had three days wet burlap and seven days wet burlap. Show some of the results with you. We evaluated a number of variables going into trying to come up with the model that will tell us what is the preferred mode of curing. And based on this model, uh, it was a statistical model that considered all the variables that we had. Based on this model, you can see that with respect to rapid dry permeability, it's extremely important to provide some sort of curing, especially at early age. So uh, air drying, you can see that has a huge influence of early values of RCP with age that influence obviously diminishes. And this is a similar plot with respect to initial absorptivity, again indicating that some sort of curing, especially at the initial eight stages, is very important. We end up specifying se seven days with the burlap curing for the actual bridge day, which by the way was not performed by the contractor. They said it's too expensive, they're not going to do it, with the Indian inspector standing right there and saying there's nothing I can do. They decide not to follow the spec. That's that problem if the bridge fails, they have to take it out. So that's interesting how, how that works. Uh, I thought that DOT engineer would have absolute veto power and say, well, that's in the spec, you should do it, right? But they didn't. With respect to the uh, strength development for those various mixes, as a function of the curing conditions, you can see that each case, the air drying, in other words, not curing at all, always produced the, the, high, uh, the, the lowest values. The differences between air curing and the other curing conditions are sort of minimized here and pretty maximized here, right? So the mixes with higher percentage of fly ash appear to be more sensitive to the light of curing. You can see that this gray line in every case indicates moist curing. We look at the scaling results, and it's pretty well known that if you have fly ash in your mixes, uh, the way we do the testing, ACMC 672, is a pretty severe test, and the mixes that have supplementary cemeteries and materials do not fare very well under these conditions. Since we had varying curing conditions, our actual testing started at 14, 17, or 21 days, depending what our curing condition was, because we wanted to keep additional 14 days of moist curing as per 672. We monitored the uh, mass losses as well as the visual appearance, and you can see that the mixes that had more problem was three days burlap curing. In this case, silica fume addition helped, obviously here, there was some additional hydration, and therefore concrete was stronger and less vulnerable. If you put 30% fly ash, uh, you increase the chances of scaling. We also repeated the test for specimens that were cured for a longer period of time. So this is testing starting at 90 days, and you can see a very similar performance to what we've seen at earlier ages. We look at the shrinkage. This is the unrestrained shrinkage. And again, if you look at the performance as a function of curing for those various mixes, you, you see a very, very similar performance. We also compared the performance of our proposed mixes with the performance of indoor class C concrete, which is a standard concrete specified by DOT for the bridge applications 
And you can see that this concrete actually has higher values of, of shrinkage. We standardized this with respect to the amount of aggregate that was in the class C concrete. And if you do that, you can see that our ternary blend actually came out on the top very well here. We also normalized it with respect to the amount of, of cement replacement level at, at various ages. And, and you can see again that we have a very downward trending curve when it comes to the free shrinkage. Restraint shrinkage was probably of greater importance. We got the results that were a little bit all over the map. You know, if you look here, you have seven days. So this is specimen one and specimen two. So you can see that they crack as a recurring compound. If you increase the amount of cementitious materials, they seem to be uh, cracking a little, a little bit faster. And definitely here, you can see that a lot of them crack. Again, if you compare this with standard in the class C concrete, you can see that depending on the curing conditions, you will have a various ages at which to crack. So trying to make sense out of that, we came up with this edge at cracking as a function of various curing conditions. And anything that you see here in green uh, would be the mixes that offer good performance. Two numbers there, 33 means that the first of the two rings fail at 33 days, the second one at 94 days. It's very difficult to get great uniformity in this restraint shrinkage test. What we try to do, we try to assess the probability of cracking. That's what is shown over here. So if you look at this black line with the gray points on it, those are 56 days uh, free shrinkage values that because majority of cracking happened, you know, about 90% of cracking happened after about 56 days of exposure. And it appears that if you want to have crack free performance, you would have to have maximum strain of about 310 micro strain. You have about 64% probability of cracking if the value of strain is 430. And essentially guaranteed cracking the value of shrinkage strain is 620. And you can see where the different mixes fell in, in, with this respect. We also wanted to determine which properties are affected the most by the curing. Uh, so we came up with the relative curing efficiency. And you can see that, for example, for early set of specimens at the early ages, uh, up to 28 days, or up to 21 days actually, absorption and rapid color permeability were the most affected. So the full circles represent the statistically important property that was affected. The open circle indicates statistically non-important property. And you can see the spread for early and late ages on this graph. Summary, this is what is affected by air drying for early ages and late ages, seven days and three days. We we'll also look at the free star resistance, and you can see the performance both at 14 days and 56 days. You can see that the ternary mixes weren't faring particularly well with this respect. Durability factors were actually quite awful. For example, 30% flyer, 7% silica feed. So we had two hypotheses what then might be happening, and the aggregate that was used for this particular project was the limestone that had some church inclusion. And the failure of specimens in the freezing and towing was to actually failure of aggregate. The aggregate with the chert inclusion was inside the beam. The beam will simply explode. And that really doesn't indicate the bad performance of concrete is really the aggregate problem. Okay? Uh, we use manual avoid system analysis to determine what are the parameters of avoid system that are of importance. We actually happen to be doing it also with the automated avoid system analysis software that was developed by uh, Dr. Peterson now in Toronto. And uh, we're trying to find the thresholding values that would be of importance for this particular bridge deck. This is the representations of the data that we got with respect to air content, void frequency, spacing factor on specific surface. Now we'll go to it quickly. Essentially, if you look at the data, they fall into two categories. The field symbols are 
mixes with the sound less than 190 millimeters, and the open symbols are mixture that have a higher slam. And if you look, if you take 60 percent as the border or value for the durability factor, meaning anything below 60 percent is considered to be a failing concrete, you will see that a lot of those open symbols are in this region. That means that countries that had slammed higher than 190 millimeters were in trouble. Based on that, we sort of determined the critical parameters of air void, void frequency, specific surface spacing factor that would be providing a durable concrete, and that was actually provided to Indo, and they put it as a requirement for the provisional spec that they that they've done. To sum it up, relative performance of those mixes and the laboratory testing, whenever you see one as the mix that passes this with the flying colors, whenever you see four, we have potential problem. So that was again used for determining what our final design should be in the field and they end up settled for mix with 20% fly ash and 5% silica fuel. So as I mentioned, we're relegated to the state of 23 near South Bend, Indiana, and there were trial batches that were performed. One was in October 2004, and we actually were casting the deck on November 3, 2004, and then the winter came, so they stopped everything and they Casted the second lane, opposite direction on the bridge, in May of 2005. This is the temperature at the side of the bridge that you can see, and you can see that about 20 days after the deck was passed, there was a first snow, and they started spraying the ice and salts. We had 20% of fly ash. We knew that there was going to be probably a problem, so we did collect a lot of information from various cooling conditions. We had some specimens that were by the bridge deck. We had some outside our lab uh, in the styrofoam form, trying to simulate the temperature history, so forth. It's too many details to, to discuss. But what I wanted to show particularly is this graph. Now, this is the mix that was cast in the field, and you can see the rapid color permeability right there was pretty high. And when we took the some of those specimens into the lab and started curing them in the lab. After about 300 days, they were pretty much catching up with respect to RCP of the mixes that were originally cured in the lab. So having it exposed to the switching and coming cycles out there wasn't good. So you can see that there was scaling on the bridge deck, and you can see a close up here. There was absolutely no problem. There were no problem with the concrete that was placed in May. I mentioned that this concrete was not cured, but it was salted about 20 days after it was placed. So, conclusions. We believe that there is, there exists a synergistic effects between components of the tenery blend, especially at ages greater than seven. All tenery concrete have excellent transport properties, very low dry permeability, water absorptivity, this is our recommendation with respect to what you should use for this kind of application for our weather conditions. Paste less than 25%, 20% higher, 5% silica. Properties most affected by lack of curing were rapid permeability, absorptivity, and scaling, and long-term strength. If you increase the amount of flyers, you have higher sensitivity to the lack of curing. We also concluded that we really do not need any modifications in the spacing factors for the standard mixes. And field performance is generally satisfactory, except for this initial RCP and low scaling resistance. 